Andy, thank you so much for coming round to my house. I'm mortified that you spotted I've got plastic grass. <laughs> <laughs> God, terrible, terrible start. Um, but anyway, we, we have so much to talk about today, uh, namely the last 15 years of your life that have been completely game changing. So if we can start by rewinding back to 2006 when you were coming back from a, a gig with Groove Armada and you picked up an article, read it, and that was the seminal moment where everything changed for you. It really was, yeah. I mean, it's testimony, I suppose, to the, the power of journalism. And uh, there was this fantastic article about industrial food production and what it means. You know, it's much more talked about now, but for human health and the environment and all the things that, you know, were talked about in Glasgow. And, yeah, it ended with this fantastic line, uh, if you don't like the system, don't depend on it. And I, I've never forgotten that. And that was a real sort of catalyst to um, initially I thought, right, you know, I'm going to feed my family. I'm going to, you know, get out of this this, this machine and stop participating in it. And so um, I got to one of the earliest books I got was uh, was a, one by John Seymour called The Art of Self-Sufficiency, which was a bit of a sort of 70s good life classic. But it is actually an amazing book. You know, it's like I mean, you you go I just went down that rabbit hole a bit and then started trying to grow vegetables and it all went wrong. Uh, and then sort of from trying to put it right, started to find out about the soil and just became fascinated with this with this process. And I, when I went down to the greenhouse for the first time and I planted my, you know, my salad seeds, and then you see that these microscopic seeds and they've become these leaves and then six weeks later you're eating them. It's like, why is this not the first thing we're taught at school? Yeah, I know. This is miraculous, you know. And so, so yeah, one thing led to another and as I got fascinated with it, you 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 know, inevitably get drawn into this question of the catastrophe that's unfolding in our agricultural soils that sustain us how the history of soil is the history of civilization, and we're, we're going down a, a well-trodden path, and it's a it's, it's a one-way street, and uh, being feeling compelled to to do something. I mean, once you've seen that stuff, you can't unsee it, you know. So that's what led to the, you know, very eccentric, borderline madness decision to to sell my publishing rights to 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 try and buy a farm in France and. And, and try and work it out, basically. Yeah, I mean, there's so, there's, there's so many routes that I want to go off on immediately. Um, before we look into that sort of dystopian descent that that is on the horizon that you are doing brilliant things to navigate and hopefully avoid, let's go back to that moment. So, so you read this article. Uh, you know, I I try and engage with as many different articles, programs, podcasts about the environment as possible. And like many people, I feel a mixture of guilt, um, a feeling of just being horrified and edginess, um, sometimes hope, which is obviously really needed as well. But I, I don't make huge life changes like I know I probably should. But for you, this was just, you couldn't turn back. Once you'd read that article, you were like, this this is it now. I know I know too much. I can't go back to my old way because obviously it'd be much easier to carry on with Groove Armada, keep making loads of money, keep traveling and staying in nice hotels. But this for you was like a game changing moment. It was, yeah. And I, you know, I was, I was thinking about this on the um, the rather long train ride down because you uh, you definitely don't live that close to where I, <laughs> where I was this so morning. So sorry. But um, but yeah, no. But uh, you know, as you say, I've exchanged a degree of well you know by anything kind of relative a great degree of financial comfort for an awful lot of financial discomfort i mean you know the 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 family silver and some has gone into this stuff you know and there's been some really dark days and there continues to be all kinds of obstacles to that and uh, and it could have been so much easier you know i could be playing records once every fortnight sitting on the beach a lot of the time seeing far more of the kids you know all these things that everyone wants to do and um and why is it that I've I've put not just me but the family and everyone who gets you know caught up in it through such a ringer you know and um, it's a very good question and and you know the, the 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 nice answer to that is like once you've kind of seen this thing nothing else really seems important I think there's probably a degree also to which when you start going down a certain road you've just gone too far and you can't turn back now that's not necessarily that's positive to a degree but that's also you get into kind of Napoleon leading his troops into Russia don't you so <laughs> it is negative after a point mm. as well um so there's probably a bit of that but um but also I think it's when you're going through these processes and trying to work things out and it's really really hard and things aren't working again and again and again and it's and and you know desperate actually is the only, is the only word that can be applied to lots of the the situations then when something comes good, 
is absolutely magical, mm. you know. And I remember like walking down to one field where I've been trying these particular experiments, and it was a whole shit show to get to that point, and it hadn't been working right. And there's like it was kind of like do or die, as it seemed to be on so many occasions. And I saw these little lines of green coming up through this rolled down cover crop, and it was like just like a hallelujah moment, you know. Mm. So I suppose it's a combination of all of those all of those factors just keep you going. I mean, what you're doing is utterly game changing and it's why I was so desperate to talk to you today because you know as I, I love to talk about mental health and wellness and that massively plays into this conversation people often disconnect the two they go environmental problems mental health problems but of course everything is connected especially when we look at our own relationship with nature and how we are nature and, and that disconnect creates so much edginess and and what you're doing is so massively practical, but so hugely systemically game changing that it's 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 beyond inspiring. And, it you know, we, we spoke to Jane Goodall on, on the podcast a month ago and we talked about hope a lot. And we need to hear good stories. We need to hear encouraging stories. Otherwise, we just give up and go, what's the point? I'll carry on as I did. But what you're doing with Wild Farmed is is utterly game changing before we get to talking about. The, the farm that you, you've got in the southwest of France and now what you're doing in the UK. Let's talk about the problem because I think we need to really emphasise and focus on what the problems are here. And one of the main ones being pesticides and that then shoots into two different domains. One is how that affects our bodies, which I think we vastly underestimate. Yeah. And the other is how much it's completely fucking up the soil and how important soil is. We don't talk about the soil when it comes to environmental issues enough. We think plastic, we think traveling, soil is key. So maybe let's start in that place. Let's talk about the importance of keeping the soil as natural as it can possibly be and how that is going to help contribute to reversing climate change. Okay, yeah, as you say, you know, once you get down this road, it is an infinite subject, you yes, know. So it it's is. Quite hard. <laughs> But yeah, it's okay. Let's start with soil. I mean, soil is 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 uh, this most simple is the basis of all life on Earth, and it's the only thing that can take death and turn it back into life again. So when the kids used to come visit the 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 farm in France, uh, one thing I used to say to them was that you could take all the computers in the world and put them around a fallen oak tree, and with all of their collective computing power, they can't turn that back into grass or daffodils or apples or oranges or whatever it is. As only soil can do that. It's home to the vast majority of terrestrial life is all living there. And so uh, that's everything we, we eat, or almost everything we eat is, uh, and breathe. And it's, it is, without that, there is nothing. Uh, and so from that starting point, we need to, to think, well, what is the soil's natural state? And its natural state is actually pretty straightforward. It's always covered up with a diversity of, of, of plant life. And so what we've done is the opposite of that. We've created a, a food growing system which leaves it bare for large periods of the time, often turned upside down. Uh, and if you imagine like turning the ocean upside down, the soil, the sort of life complex is, is equally as, if not more complicated than the, 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 the equivalent in the ocean. So if you turn the ocean upside down, you get the bottom feeders at the top and the, and the plankton down the bottom and then they all, most of them die and they try and get back to where they should be again and on the way, you know, then, and then just when they get sorted again, you turn it all upside down again. So, so we, we, we've created a farming system which leaves soil bare most of the time. It destroys that soil life. And every time you, you, you move the soil, oxygen goes in. And in the soil, are vast, vast reserves of carbon, far more than the world's forests. And the oxygen combines with that carbon to produce, obviously, CO2. And so uh, instead of having carbon in the soil to store water and create fertility and allow plants to grow, it becomes a problem. Um, so that's what we've got to turn around. And one of the things that I was sort of shocked to see, this was something I watched about six months ago, was the documentary, is it called Kiss the Ground? Yeah. Um, and I hadn't realised how important soil was for a start. I was completely oblivious, which I feel deeply sad about. And the fact that so much of the Earth's surface uh, and the topsoil is now arid land, and that is contributing to climate change in a huge catastrophic way because obviously the sun is just bouncing off this land where it should be vegetation and again you know I'm not in the in the agricultural world so I don't have this conversation enough but I feel like that's not talked about much again we hear about plastic and we hear about you know car fumes and aeroplanes and traveling but again this the arid land problem I don't really think that's that's no. touched upon enough 
No, I think, I think, well, we could probably just, yeah, sort of box off all these negatives and then talk about, because with all these negatives comes comes huge source of hope and positives as well, which we can come, come back to yeah. because it is important to hang on to yeah, that. Yeah, of course, it gets we need hope. Bleak. What happens is that the soil and the plants evolved together. One created the other. And so the soil is the digestive tract of the plant, basically. So um, when that's all functioning, then uh, the plant is healthy. And when a plant isn't healthy nature's balancing mechanisms it, it sends in insects to eat that plant to make sure that it doesn't set seed so in that their way in that way you keep you know healthily functioning systems and you and you favor the the, the strongest plants and so when you turn all that soil upside down and you kill all that soil life then you the plant has lost its digestive tract and so then you have to feed it chemically. And it turned out that after World War II, we had all this spare nitrogen, which is explosives, basically. So we're like, oh, right, we can whack that on and, and they grow like wildfire. Mm. Well, they do. But they grow in a completely imbalanced way, in the same way that you can give people sugar cubes and they'll stay alive as well, but they're going to get ill. Yeah. And that's what happens to the plants. And so the insects come in to do their job and get rid of that plant because it shouldn't be there because it's weak. And so rather than taking that as a sign that, We've got a problem. We were like, hang on a minute. Also left over from the Second World War. We've got the we've got a solution here. We just kill them too. Oh God, yeah. And so so on on it goes. And so you end up in a situation where the soil, as you say, is being degraded and actually just physically lost. You know, the stats are just, kind of don't, it's like thirty six billion tons a year, which is just kind of a meaningless number. But more kind of human version of that is that there are large areas of of the states, for example, which are growing maize, where their biggest export every year by weight is soil, not the grain. I mean, that's wow. just insane. You know, so you've got that going on. We've lost eighty percent of our insects. You know, that windscreen thing where it used to be loads of bugs on the windscreen, there aren't anymore. Yeah, uh, and and all of that comes down to the fact that we're trying to grow food in a way where we've declared war on nature. And we're trying to fight against all of its natural tendencies. We're trying to create monocultures instead of diversity. And we're trying to create bare earth rather than covered earth. And that's a war that we just can't win. And it comes down to money because people can farm. And I mean, this is a huge financial infrastructure that's problematic from start to finish because farmers aren't getting paid enough. Supermarkets are selling food for cheap. People don't want to buy organic food because it's more expensive. We don't realise the problem that pesticides are causing our physical bodies and that's putting a strain on the NHS like the problem just spirals out of control from that point let's go back to the hopeful bit so there's there's great hope with what you're doing and other people are doing but you're doing in game-changing ways you've done it in France you've got the equivalent of an English knighthood in France for doing this beautiful work doing the same here there are ways that you can rectify all these problems we've got in place but what about the financial situation and how yeah, there's this financial problem with with how food is just distributed and then consumed in, in supermarkets and shops. There's a huge financial problem, not least because our cheap food is a total illusion for the reasons that you say that it doesn't pay any of its bills. Mm. So it's not paying its bills in terms of all that carbon release from the soil, uh, which is vast, vast amounts. I can't remember if it's 25% or 30% of all total CO2 emissions come from carbon that's been released from the soils. It doesn't pay its... NHS bill, because what the current farming system is superb at, is producing empty calories. And so and we, we can feed ourselves, but we're not nourishing ourselves. And so that plus the cocktail of, of chemical residues that, that our foods are laced with is demonstrably at the heart of all these chronic illnesses that we just find normalized now, the yeah. cancers and heart, but it's not normal at all. Uh, and, there's, and, there's, and there's studies going back as long as you like where communities who live off food that's grown in fertile soil, these things just do not exist. They don't exist. This is not normal. So it doesn't pay any of those bills at all. It doesn't pay any of the bills for all the nitrates in the water that the water companies don't know how to get out or all of the, uh, of the flooding because we've got no more carbon in the soil to hold on to the, the rainwater. The actual costs of our food are astronomical. Astronomical. It's just that we don't pay them yet. And so when you're trying to do something about this, it's hard because the market is so unfair. And yet um, it is what it is. And there's no point um, just saying, well, we're going to make super pricey food for, for, for a lucky elite who can afford to actually nourish themselves rather than just eat whatever's put in front of them. That's pointless. Uh, and so the wild farm project is about trying to square that, those two things on the one hand, 
break down all the cultural and financial barriers for farmers so they can change because there's a whole lot of other, other issues over there which makes it very difficult for them to do that but also do that efficiently enough so that we can we can supply supermarkets and not just like hipster bakeries because that's not going to sort it out. Well, this is it. It needs to be an en masse um, goal for you guys, I guess, which is, you know, I'm sure it feels insurmountable at times because you're rallying against all of these systemic problems that have been in place for so long. But hope has to be there. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother. You no, would, would give it, up. Would it, would it, you know, and there is so much to be hopeful about. And that is that, for example, these agricultural landscapes that have been so denuded for so long, uh, that's, you know, something like 70% of land in the UK is is, is agricultural land. So that's re-engineered twice a year. I mean, some exceptions to that, some of it's kind of, you know, uplands, it's in pastures or whatever. But there's a huge swathe of the UK where people go out in their in their tractors twice a year and they, they change it all. And so that's a massive opportunity to very, very quickly turn things around. I saw at the farm in France, which was some of the worst soil that you'll ever find. It was technically declared dead. You give nature half a chance uh, to come back and it comes roaring back, you know. So the agricultural landscape is a, is a massive opportunity to turn around climate change, to turn around biodiversity, and to turn around health. Because if it's not in the soil, it's not on your plate. And at the moment, it's not in our soils. It's not. And I think, OK, there's two different ways I want to go to this conversation. First up, how, how, I mean, it's not solely your job, but how do you propose to get the agricultural world on board with this way of farming? Because it's historically now so seeped in using certain machinery, using pesticides. Obviously, they're not getting paid fairly, but it's the system that they're working in. How, how do you propose to kind of help change the landscape over here in the same way that you've done in France? Well, uh, there's different aspects to it. You know, so, some some farmers uh, will want to come on board because they share all these concerns. Yeah. And they, they want to change for ecological reasons. Some farmers will want to come on board because the funny thing is that despite the fact that the current system is not paying any of its bills along the lines we just talked about, and despite the fact that ultimately, you know, there's, a, there's about 10 times more energy goes into a conventionally farmed field than comes out as food. So for every unit of food, you've poured the equivalent of 10 units of oil in a field. And so it's all based on petrochemicals. And despite the fact that that remains one of the most subsidized industries in the world, I mean, go figure on that one. But despite that, despite the fact it doesn't pay its bills, it's not stacking up for the farmers. And so like over the last few months, when the price of fertilizer has gone up three times because energy prices have gone up, and fertilizer requires huge amounts of energy. It has a, a direct climate impact on, on on that level. It requires huge amounts of energy to make it, and so they're in a really difficult position. And, and, and so that is an Achilles heel, which is which is good in lots of ways. Not because it means that you know farmers have suffered for so long and suffering even more, but there is an opportunity to go and say, look, come do this, yeah. and this this makes money. You know, so we have to attack it in different ways, and, and we are doing. And so some people it's a purely financial transaction. I'm fine with that. And some people are like, I'm fascinated by the actual technique, and, and that's great too. And um, and it's, so, so you end up with this huge variety of growers. And you know, one of the sort of magical moments over the last, well, there's been two over the, over the last week. Like what one was with growers, and this wildly different people. You know, some lords and ladies, and some, some you know, the sort of people who, who you kind of picture when you think of a farmer. You know, but all just sort of in this room discussing the system that we use and, and, uh, and you know, just being really excited and motivated and maybe we can adjust this and improve that. And it's just that I was just sort of standing back and watching it for a second. And Or like last night, there were these there were these dinner ladies that we were doing a little film launch last night and there was these dinner ladies there who were, who were using the flour to cook these Somalian flatbreads and they've planted a three metre by three metre wheat field outside the kitchen window with wheat and clover to show how the two plants can grow together. Wow. I mean, magic you know so i'm not quite sure where the question began there but anyway most of my questions are completely irrelevant <laughs> it's just extracting your your wisdom on this so this is correct me if i'm wrong i don't know any of the terminology properly but this is combination farming combination planting what's the terminology i'm I looking like for it. where it, it is now it is now it's something like that so you're planting <laughs> lots of things in a field yeah and it's just you're letting nature do its thing you've got you've got livestock in in the same areas and everything is just left to to do its thing i mean it's not that simple obviously but but talk about well, the it's technique not far off yeah, I mean, basically, all of this came from, I had a real, like, um, lowest of the low moment at the farm in France where um, I was, this was before, I, I was trying to grow uh, 
organic crops on really degraded land um, without the use of the things that we're about to talk about in a second. And, and so what happens is when land's really degraded, nature in its infinite wisdom sends out plants that are capable of growing when everything's knackered. So they grow in really infertile conditions. And there's a whole army of those seeds in the ground that will wait until they're needed, and when they're needed, out they come. And they're things like thistles and dock leaves and bindweed and all the things that you, you want to get rid of. Yeah. And so then you, you work the soil even harder to get rid of those. And, of course, you then amplify the conditions in which they need to be there. And so you're in this kind of vicious cycle. Anyway, so I was doing this stuff and I was growing these soya beans and it had been all kinds of disasters. I had to harvest these soya beans because soya beans are quite a high value crop. And it was all looking fine. And then this t- particular weed called Datura, which is more of a French thing, but it's highly toxic. Apparently, if you have a little bit of it, it's quite hallucinogenic in a fun <laughs> way. But it is highly toxic. You've got a side business there. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> there was a moment when that seemed to be my only way out, to be honest. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so they're highly toxic. So if you've got any of that in your harvest, you can't sell it. Right. So I was like, shit, right. So I started pulling these plants up. Then there were 100. So I got some friends around, and there were 1,000. So there was, like, loads of us there in the fields pulling these things up. And then it was just like a whole forest. It was like I'd sowed it perfectly. Oh, my God. And it was all growing higher than the soybeans. And so I borrowed this machine that a neighbour had made. And these are all these machines that we make because we're basically locked in this non-winnable warfare with natural systems. But his version was these like a bar with flymo blades on it. Uh, and the idea is that you can move this bar up and down and it cuts above what you want to keep, in my case, the soy beans. And it cuts off the top of these weeds that have now gone higher than the soy beans to stop them from making seed. So he, get, he lent me this thing. It's like a tractor with no cabin. I've got like the flying goggles on because there's debris going everywhere. You've got to keep your mouth shut. It's 35 degrees. You're Dro- thinking, why am I not just DJing in Ibiza well, somewhere? I was thinking exactly <laughs> that. And then uh, so I got, got across halfway across the field and just realised the utter futility of what I was doing. Mm. Totally futile because as anyone who's done the most basic gardening knows, if you cut off the top of a plant, it'll just make a new flower further down. And, uh, and it was just like, this is, this is nonsense. And so I got off that, that tractor thinking, this is it, it's the end of the road. And I am answering your question here. And, and, and at that point, um, I ended up by this really bizarre circumstance in a Norfolk bookshop when I was looking for an Enid Blyton book for my daughter, uh, coming across this book by Albert Howard called The Agricultural Testament. And he was a guy from 107 years ago, we talked about him some other time, amazing man who did all this research. And the short version of his book is, when you put a diversity of plants and animals together, like nature does, everything's fine. And as soon as you separate that up, everything isn't fine. And so uh, I thought, right, before I give up, I've got to try this. So I said to my poor, long-suffering wife, look, I really want to get some cows, you know, and I'd never had She's a cow. like, for fuck's sake, <laughs> yeah, like, why am I not in Ibiza? <laughs> cows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much what happened. And um, But yeah, I'd never had a cow or a dog, you know, so they right. were the cows. Right, I've got it? a cow, right, okay. So the cows turn up and there's come some, some comedy moments with the neighbour's dog and you can you can imagine the stories. Anyway, we got going with the, with the cows and these and these pastures that, that I started following Albert Howard's advice, and then we start grazing them, and, and grazing can be good or bad. But if grazing is done, everyone who's seen Kiss the Ground will know that you need to graze in a way which mimics what lions used to do. So they would keep all the, the cattle's predecessors tight and moving. So you can do that with electric fences. So if you do that, the, 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 the consequences for the soil and wildlife restoration so quickly is absolutely miraculous. Wow. Absolutely miraculous. So from that point on... I was like, right, the, the sort of better end of of, um, of of organic farming would then do like three or four years of, of, of those pastures and then plough that up and do a couple of years of crops to basically cash in the fertility that you created and then you go back to grass again. But in my fragile little soils with all this miraculous stuff happening, I really, really didn't want to turn it all upside down again. So that was sort of led to this obsession with how can we put annual grains like wheats and barley and right? they're all annual plants in the same field as all this other stuff and kind of mix it all together. And so this is where I get back to the question that you asked, is that the current system is is that. So if you imagine it's like a, a pasture, which is like diverse grassland with lots of clovers and different flowers and plants in there. And within that, there are strips where the crop is, whether that's wheat or barley or rye. And all of those crops are staples. They're all just grasses. So up to a certain point, you can just graze them too. 
Mm. Um, uh, and there comes a point when what becomes the, the ear, where all the seeds are, that begins life underground and it comes up the stem and somewhere around April it's above ground. Now at that point you've got to take the animals out because if otherwise you, you can't see the ear but it's in the stalk and if they eat that off then you don't want that. So that's when the grazing stops and then we use this, this gadget called a, well it's called an interrow mower because it mows the rows of pasture that are between the crops and that just sort of sees you through to the end of the cycle and then you go all over again. So this has been 15 years of trial and error getting to a place where you are helping with this systemic change and you're you're now you're in the UK you've been you know I don't know if you've been given this land but you've you've bid and got this beautiful plot of land here and you're going to mimic the same thing here and one of the things I was super interested in was the film that that you were talking about that you released last night is this wonderful short film about bread which is our most loved food in the UK. I think it's something like 12 million loaves of bread are bought a day in the UK. Everybody loves bread. Everybody eats it. We have no clue what's in it. Usually the bread we're buying is pumped full of shit. And if we go back for a tiny moment to the problem here, we are constantly underestimating what that is doing to our insides. I think we just go, oh, well, it's cheaper. And and for some people, there is no choice. They can only buy the cheaper option. So they are ingesting chemicals on a daily basis. Like you say, all of these new illnesses and ailments and problems that the NHS are having to deal with have been completely normalised and we're not really looking at the root cause. And there's certainly not much being done from the top when it comes to the government or you know, big supermarkets or food manufacturers. So it is down to people like yourself having to, you know, start the change on this level and, and grow it outwards. So now, so so wheat is your thing and making this lovely wild farmed bread that is pure, organic, no shit in it. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, it's um, well, I say wheat is the thing, actually, we, we know we're doing other things like, you know, oats and rye and barley and, and stuff. And um, yeah, because I think, what you were just saying there is, is is this isn't going to come from the top down we don't need to go into why all the revolving doors all the things we know about so it needs to come from 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 the bottom up and uh, i think for that for that to happen actually i think the opportunities for for change in the farming sector are huge and it's ready and we've got lots of growers that would love to work with us and there are lots of other people doing great stuff as well and actually if there's a break on this it's it's about people understanding why this is important and that why their food choices matter and that every time you eat food you shape your own future and you shape the future of the planet and that's something that we just don't put together and we don't put together the fact that there's I mean I'm watching David Attenborough I'm shit myself about biodiversity loss uh, or I'm, I'm listening to all these predictions for the climate and, I, I, and I'm terrified for my children and grandchildren but there's nothing I can do every time you eat there's something you can do so long as we can do enough of it so that you've actually got choice in your yeah. local supermarket to buy something that's come from the right thing. So there's a degree of chicken and egg in all of this. But when you said that about not having any shit in it, that is one thing. And that's one thing that the, the, the organic movement has done brilliantly. And we need to now add to that conversation and say it's not about not having shit in it. It's about what you actually do have in it as yeah. well. You know, yeah. and, and, um, and, 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 and the lack of all of these... Um, trace elements in our food which are absolutely critical and the way that um, you know glyphosate for example roundup uh, it stops the, the the creation of of certain critical amino acids and all this stuff you know we're depriving our bodies of basic building blocks and when you do that at some point it goes wrong yeah you know? and so um, you know I think it's it's an empowering message to people that they can take back control <laughs> to re- retool that phrase a bit on all kinds of different levels and I think we have to be, you have to approach it in different ways. Like in Germany, there was an example where they said to school kids, don't have burger and chips at lunchtime every day because, you know, it's bad for you and there's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the consumption went up. Wow. And then and in, in, in a, in a neighbouring school, they said, you have your burger and chips if you want, but you're being had. And the people making all that stuff, they know that they're, they're, they're putting you down the road to diabetes, they're pushing you down the road to, to, to obesity, it's degrading all the land that it came out of, which is going to, you know, screw your future, but they don't give a shit. And you're, you're, you're a mug enough to eat it, and the consumption of that plummeted. 
Mm. So I think it's a question of getting the you know the right message out there that we can do stuff about this, and ultimately big corporations are big because they've got lots of customers. This is it. We we have to vote with our cash, and we've had similar conversations with I'm thinking like David Katz who came on the podcast, and certainly Jane Goodall as well about how we do that. You know what food we choose, and like you're saying, there's that chicken and egg thing. But surely, if we are pulling focus from those big companies who know that they're just you know. They're not accountable in any sense, but they're just selling us stuff with all sorts of crap in it that's ruining us, us our bodies and the planet. Surely if there's a, enough people that, that want to put their money where their mouth is and, and buy stuff that they know is going to have a, a beneficial, um, you know, long-lasting effect on the planet and ourselves, the supply and demand thing, you guys will have to grow and get bigger because the, the demand is there. So we do have more agency than, than we think we do, perhaps. No, we really do, you know, and it's like, you know, again, there's, you know, there's reasons to be cheerful, you know, the uh, just in our, the thing that we're trying to do and, the, you know, we are one of many people trying to do good things of this sort, you know, we were hoping to be working with, uh, you know, 20 or so farmers for the for the sowing season that's just finished because you, with, with what's called winter wheat, you sow it in September, October, and you harvest it the following August. So we're just coming to the end of that kind of sowing period. And in the end, we uh, we, we ended up with, I don't know if it's 43 or 45, I can't remember, but somewhere around 45. And we had to stop there just because we didn't have the kind of the infrastructure or the seed or anything to deal with it, you know. So, and we've got people queuing up for for next year and on a consumer level you know the 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 sales are going up and we're just trying to make this an option that more and more people have got access to you know but when you you see the the wild diversity of people at that film thing from these these dinlays with the somalian flatbreads to sort of you know high-end chefs and pete tong and you know it's <laughs> It's great, you know. People are up for this. We can do this thing, and um, yeah, there's going to be some some bumps in the road. And whenever you stick your neck out, uh, as you know, you know people come at you, and some yeah. of it's quite personal and, and whatever. All that stuff's going to happen, but we can do this. And uh, it's a cliche that the the powers with the people, but it really is. It is. We want to see uh, Pete Tong do a farm. That's what we need next. All the DJs you know need to buy a farm. Sell the back catalogue, <laughs> get a farm. We can cover a lot of land in that way. I'm thinking. Um, it's so brilliant what you're doing. And you said a while back in this conversation something super important, which I know your friend George Lamb, who is currently in my kitchen drinking tea, is all over. And, I, you know, this is my first time meeting you, but I've, I've known George for a very long time and we've bumped into each other over the years. And I, I've seen from afar and also from talking to him that he's been squirrelling away and working so hard on the educational system. And I remember him talking about this when it was a fetal idea, maybe, I don't know how many years ago it was now, but saying... There's something so fundamentally wrong with with how we're teaching children about the world and and just the the educational format. You know, I've got two young kids, and it is it, schooling hasn't changed from when I was a kid, and probably really from when my parents was a kid. You learn the subjects that seemingly will see you through life, and you get a grade at the end of it. Whereas George's new manifesto is based all around kids understanding this stuff and seeing seeds planted, plants growing, and that going from the soil onto a dinner table how are you guys working together and combining these these two trains of thoughts and, and your passions yeah well you know there's a, there's a there's a quote which i can't quite remember and i can't remember who said it but it's something like it's, it's, <laughs> that sounds stuff. brilliant yeah it's gonna be absolute radio gold no it's um it's something like uh, that you you'll only preserve what you'll love you'll only love what you'll understand and you'll only understand what you've been taught Mm. something like that it's not quite that but you get the idea yeah yeah uh, and uh, and so yeah as i said to you before like when i walked into my little greenhouse that i've made and i saw these seeds that have become these two leaves it was um, the, one of the most miraculous moments of, of my life you know and, and um and that does need to be the first thing we've done at school so george has taken that on the chin and he started um he got this plot of land at an academy in tottenham and turned it into um education through food we did a thing a couple of weeks ago with Natura, who are more on the vegetable side, regen vegetable side, and they've got a big educational push going on. So we're trying to unify those two things whilst working with and supporting with, like, for example, the DIN ladies that I've been talking about. I, and I can't remember her name, unfortunately, but the, the lady who's running that school is just working miracles. Mm. And again, to be hopeful, uh, she's just had a visit from the Department for Education and they're like they saw like the wheat field outside the window and everything that's going on and, and the way they're teaching the kids through food and through, through you know through farming 
and they're like, we want to do this, you know. So um, I think, like all these things, it's going to be actually just getting off your backside and doing something. So, like, you know, George is going to – is making his system modular so that we can make it very accessible for as many other schools as, as possible, the initiatives of the, of the lady I was just talking about, and then just doing those hard yards and those long meetings where you just try and turn – the slow wheels of power into the right God, direction. I do not envy you because I can't even imagine how painful that is considering you know that this works and you know that this is our route out of climate disaster, but also that that huge necessity of kids not only understanding why I can plant this and then I can eat this, but also teaching kids from a young age that that we are nature. And I feel like our generation, our parents' generation... There's a there's a disconnect, you know, on mass there's a disconnect, and I think all of us feel it. My friend Sarah Wilson in Australia wrote this amazing book called This One Precious Life, and it's based all around that feeling of edginess. Like, God, I know that what I've just bought online, I don't know, you know, where it's from. I know it's cheap, and that feels awful, and it's going to be delivered via a petrol-based vehicle, and like every bit of the process feels awful. But we kind of go duh, 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 press, and we just kind of then push it to the back of our minds and get on with our day. Yeah. And we're doing that with so many things, whether it be online shopping or what we're buying food-wise or how we're travelling, the stuff that comes in plastic. It's really hard to buy, you know, like loose fruit and veg, like berries without there being some sort of plastic container. I think most of us feel that subconscious edginess all the time. So we need ways out. We need ways out and we need... Yeah, hopeful stories to believe that we aren't just on this horrible descent. And I think teaching kids that from a young age is one of the methods of of cultivating hope. I guess. I think so. I think that that dis- that disconnect is is critical. That there's there's a there's a book called Taming the Wild, which is a quite sort of PhD style tome. I wouldn't say it's a page turner, <laughs> but the um, uh, the 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 sort of essence of that was really fascinating in that it's it, it's when the Europeans arrived in mm-hmm. California and they and they go ashore and they describe this extraordinary abundance like there's so much fish in the river they can't get the horses across and then they'll go into a valley and they'll be like it'll just be laden with perfect fruit trees you know or, or with their immaculate looking fruit and then they'll go into meadows where they'll be amongst the wild grasses they'll be you know, grasses with bigger grains, what you know, our wheats and the things that we like, you know, which are just grasses with bigger grains. Uh, and um, and they were like, wow, you know, this is just like the most incredible kind of wilderness, except it wasn't a wilderness at all. It had been managed by the local population for thousands of years and they just sort of tweaked nature in the right direction to make sure that they got what they wanted out of it. Anyway, this the inevitable happened and this abundance got commoditized and sold. Uh, and what seemed to be an inexhaustible resource was, of course, exhaustible. A skip forward, you know, a blink of an eye, 150 years or 200 years, whatever it was, and um, and it's looking crap. And so that led to the creation of what apparently was the first national park, where it's like, well, we're, we're going to fence that bit off before we, you know, fuck that one up too yeah. kind of thing. And coming out of that was, the, so there we've got what we think of as a wilderness, which is, you know, this untouched, pristine thing that we haven't messed up. But what was fascinating was that the local population, their version of the wilderness, when they saw these towns developing with populations in them that had no relationship or knowledge of their local environment. And their definition of wilderness was that. Mm. And that was a real sort of telling distinction. It's sort of scary and sad. It is, but <clears throat> coming back to the, you know, the, the, the positives, it is scary and sad, but I do think that through explaining to people about the link between soil health, plant health, human health, how we grow our food can turn around all of our major societal issues and it can do so really, really fast, really fast. This is in the power of all of us to do this and our little thing that we've been doing is exponential at the moment, you know, and so we can really make inroads on this problem uh, and start ticking these boxes. Uh, we, we can do so now. We don't have to wait for anything. We don't need any technological no. inventions. We we've got everything we need. Yeah. We can do it now. We just need people to get the importance of it. And and it, and it it like you say, it ticks so many boxes because it's solving huge climate crisis problems. It's 
uh, it's helping our mental health because we're we're feeling at one with nature. We're out in nature. We're we're in the soil. We're touching it. We're feeling it. We're experiencing it. We're eating better, so that's going to create equilibrium within our physical bodies. It's creating community because you've got to work, you know, within your whether you live in a town, a village, whatever it is, but you've got to work together. It's ticking all the boxes that we know we're not even looking at. So it, it's sort of um, maddening that we're not all jumping on this straight. Like you must be frustrated at times and think, why can we not just make this happen now? Because as you said, the answers are there. You can do it now. Yeah, well, we can. And, you know, there's, there's, there's great people out in the States there. And there's a, there's a guy who does a series of, I mean, it's more kind of, you know, nerdy agricultural podcast thing over there. But he always ends with that. It's like we don't need any more advances in knowledge or information we have everything we'll say we, we, we that wouldn't be nice as well we don't need anything to turn this whole thing around from tomorrow let's go you know yeah uh, and yeah okay it, it's maddening but then like i don't i've started lost track of time but say three years ago i was on my farm in france and um and and so there'd been this all these experiments and these dark days and then it had, and I was farming with horses for a long time and I, I learned that off the A mission. There's a whole bit in the middle there which we haven't talked about, but that's not really the, the subject for today. But that was kind of fascinating. <laughs> and uh, so I was farming with, farming with horses. We were growing these cereals in these pastures, and then uh, we'd had to. You end up with high nutrition, lower yield. So you you can't then sell that into the existing system and it gets mixed up in some kind of biscuit flour because it doesn't doesn't make any sense yeah. on any level. So that led to the need to add value, and so uh, that led to creating a getting a mill. I got the wrong mill, had to get the right mill, and then I took my flour around, you know, with the picture of the horses on that I used to grow it and the pastures, thinking, well, this is going to be a you know a hit. Uh, yeah, this it's going to be shoeing. <laughs> <laughs> absolute no absolute shoeing no one wanted to buy it mm. because there there was not the amount of gluten in there that that are, that are easy to use in a lot of the conventional bread making system so then I thought like, right, shit right I'm really I'm in a hole now so I'm gonna have to learn how to make bread and uh, I found this book which had been written by the French king's baker back in the day when everyone was using these sort of these type of uh, wheats and uh, and so that gave, put me on the right path ended up making this bread and then that went down quite well and people found it very digestible and then we ended up making bread for the schools and blah 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 and then we ended up with like eight employees on this little farm and it's kind of the regen pinup except when George and Ed my wild farm partners came over you zoom out and you've got this little oasis and all of my farming neighbours or less so than their immediate neighbours but in the region as a whole um, it's just bare earth six months of the year saw going in the river pesticide I'm in mean, the full horror show yeah. uh, and and these people like the, a lot of them my friends they work so hard and they've been pushed to the brink by all of these different forces and uh, and if and if you wait if we wait for them to overcome the sort of cultural baggage to do things differently, like dad's still around and looking over my shoulder and all that kind of stuff. The financial requirements to get rid of everything they've got and turn it around. And then to like, well, actually, I've got a bit less now, but I've got higher nutrition. I'm going to set up a bakery. I mean, we're just going to run out of ecological run. Yeah. You know, so again, I've not forgotten the question here, but <laughs> the um, the thing with the wild farm thing was like, right, we need to make that easy for farmers yeah. and then educate con- consumers that they can participate in this transformation. That was not that long ago. You know, and I was living in France until four months ago when I managed to luckily win the bidding thing for a national trust farm. You know, last night there were 400 people in in this room and there were these, there's this map of the UK with all these growers on like dots. There's there's 45 dots on there. Mm. I mean, it is fast and there's hunger for this stuff. And it's an empowering message where we don't have to wait for anyone. We don't have to wait for anyone. We just do it. It's so exciting, and I, I desperately want to do other things with you and George. And I, don't, I haven't met Ed before, but I'm, I'm desperately wanting to be on board with what you're doing because it, it, it's so exciting. It feels exciting. It feels like it's practical, but it's so hopeful. And there's, there's just so much in it that's so wonderful. And, and also just your story is so inspiring because I think we get to a certain point in our lives or an age where we think, this is what I do. This is how my life works. I, you know, there's a level of comfort, but also um, I haven't got the energy for for anything new. And I'm a big fan of chapters. I had a bit of a, a page turn, I guess, four or five years ago myself, moving from more traditional broadcasting 
into what I'm doing now and it feels really exciting again and it feels like I've found my purpose and what I want to do but for you it wasn't just like a page turn you threw the book away like this was like I'm just starting again and I don't think any of us realized we can do that well you know you at, at a point in your life what were you 35 when when this sort of idea came into your head that feels you know on a societal level, too old to be changing your whole life and changing your story. But it's not. That's just something that we've got kind of a bit lazy with maybe or we've just kind of settled on like, yeah, this is kind of just how my life's going. But for you, that was the, the sort of start of of you, I guess. Does, does it feel that way? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly... It's, it's, a, it's a funny one because it touches on all kinds of things about like, you know, what's the nature of happiness and all kinds yeah. of things because it's 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 been... Like there's this whole sort of narrative, isn't there, is that if you can sit on the sofa and get paid and avoid physical labour, you've won. Mm-hmm. That's a, kind of like the backstory to a lot of our of of, of our society today. Yeah. You know, one of the many things that I've discovered since making this sort of rather radical switch is that physical labour is a fantastic thing. And you know, so when when people would would come over to the farm and we, you know, whatever it was we, we were doing, and uh, we'd maybe be fencing or planting trees or field work, you know, with the horses or whatever, and, and it's like you'd sit down, have a bit at the end of the day, and you're like, oh god, I feel great. Yeah. It's like, well, of course you feel great because you've used your body for what it's intended for, and you've had that smell of soil in your nostrils all day long, and that's you know, and of course you feel great because that's kind of that's ticking every box that we were. That we were, um, you know, made for. But you know, I think in terms of the the transitional thing, is that 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 what I had before that feeling when you're standing in the wings with your mates, or you're having a few beers in the bar before a night out DJing, and the whole town's on the move, and like you're at the heart of that thing, and that is magic. You know, mm. it's absolute magic. But it's it, it's an adrenaline based happiness. That you I'm not therefore I wouldn't say don't do it because it's wicked, you know. <laughs> and my son's about to do it, and my daughter maybe wants to do it as well, whatever. But you know, great. But it, you, you, you're you're chasing that, yeah. you know, and it's a different thing. And then, what well, I've had the, the the fortune to sort of experience through my kind of rather mental shift is um, is the different kind of happiness. Part of it is the kind of just doing physical labour in the context of a project that makes sense in your head. That's a great combination, and and the second bit of it is like risk getting cliche, but there's a phrase in French about uh, le bonheur suit l'effort, which is basically happiness follows effort. But you know, um, and that can be a bit sort of Victorian in a way. But what I mean by that is like when it's been really fucking hard, and then you get those moments. And it could be the dinner ladies, or it could be watching those guys up there talking about tweaks to the machine, or it could be my little rose of green coming up through the, the 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 roll cover crop. It is just magic, like on a on a kind of depth that is hard to convey. You know, it's and um, and so yeah, I don't know where I was going with that really, but basically, yeah, that thing of just that the, my life is like this and things are comfy. You know, I think we can often mix up comfort and happiness, and they're two oh, very different God, things. I completely agree because I think. This plays into my own sort of feelings about creativity, which are massively important to my own wellness. Like for me to feel good, I have to be creating something. And there's a a, a magical creativity when it comes to planting things because you are quite literally creating something. Yeah, life, you're creating life. And I need to get in on the, uh, yeah, this is the next phase for me for sure. But my creativity at the moment is much more based around sort of writing and painting and even talking I see as as a sort of creative endeavour because we're on picking stuff and there's usually some sort of end result. And I I love that feeling. And sometimes I get into a a cycle of, of that feeling that you've just described where you go, oh my God, I just want to get to the end of this week and have the weekend where I can just chill out. I mean, I've got young kids, that's impossible. But the idea is there. Like, I can sit on the sofa and I can watch Succession on repeat and I end up feeling like death. Like, I don't feel good when I'm doing that. I crave it, I get to it, and I feel edgy but empty. And I know it doesn't work for me, but I still get caught in the trap because I think on a societal level, again, like, pop culture depicts this thing of you know, you win and then you chill and it's all wonderful and it's great. Or you've won the big reality show and then you get to be rich and hang around and do nothing forever. And if I don't have an element of creativity in my day, like every day, I feel terrible. And I've learned that through trial and error. And I really 
have to make sure that it's it, it's a part of my day, even in tiny ways, unseen ways, things that are just for me. So I, I, I'm I listening to you talking about that amazing process of, you know, and the physical labour bit. My dad's been a sign writer since he was about 15. He only retired a couple of years ago. And of course, he hasn't retired because so much of it was about, you know, knocking big signposts into big holes in the ground, climbing up Wembley Arena to pin a sign up and, and whatnot. So now he's tinkering around, helping out people with, you know, machinery in the local area or making things or he helped fix my father-in-law's Romany caravan that he had in the garden all sorts of crazy things but he you can't let go of that you retire but you that is such a fundamental part of happiness and you're right we, that doesn't come into the conversation of of wellness we think it's all about the either the rest or the the chilling out at the end of it but the 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 bit where you ex, you know you um you expel energy and you are in the cycle of creating or doing something, there's happiness in it. It's not the end of it. It's the doing bit. Yeah, no, it's it, exactly. I think the process rather than the, rather than the destination. And, you know, and I think it does require context. Like, you know, my, like my dad, um, when he was younger, he worked in a cement bag factory. Now that's physical labor. That's just crap. But I, so I think that it does need to be of the right sort. But yeah, you know, I think when you're, when you can combine effort, with a narrative in your head that your your effort is part of that makes sense to you and feels relevant and important then that's the real sweet spot and yeah. uh, and and you know so you know you do like a whole day of tree planting and be utterly exhausted and there's, uh, and you're never going to feel better than that you know and mm. I, so i think that um i think that's an in, important thing of just like we've got these amazing like hands and bodies and stuff and um and we need to use them and through doing that, yeah, the, the, it's that that holistic thing, isn't it? All the all this the, this wellness stuff is is a nutritional thing. It's a does my life make sense thing, and a, and it's a physical thing as well. I mean, to yeah, you know, maybe just do a bit less time on the hamster's wheel in the gym and go and plant some trees. Yeah, exactly. Again, that whole you know, I guess you know, the wellness it, it's an industry now, isn't it? And that that's where it, there's the sort of sticky point of it. But you know, how much of it do you buy into, and how much feels right to you, and you know, the sort of gym culture is a big part of that because I guess sort of in the 90s, it was like the gym was everything and you'd go in there to release all of this energy and, and work your body. And um, you can go and do that for free anywhere. Go for a walk in the park or go for a run or whatever. Um, and what we I must sort of say is prior to you reading this article, there wasn't sort of like farming in your family history or anything. You 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 were the first one to kind of go, this is my thing. Yeah, I'd, I'd, never, I'd never planted a... A bedding plant, you know. I mean, literally nothing. I mean, my only experience of anything like this. Um, well, and it's funny, isn't it? Because I hadn't thought about this at all. But my my nan grew up in the slums of Paddington, and then she ended up heading up north where I was born, near Barnsley, where she spent her retirement. Uh, and she had a little greenhouse, and uh, and she grew a few. Um, she she got out of London, had a garden for the first time, got really into gardening. And in this greenhouse, she had some tomatoes. And um, when I when I read this article, I went down the self sufficiency route, and so I planted my first tomatoes. and And then there's a smell: tomatoes in the greenhouse has a smell, the best, and, and, and an amazing smell. And when I went in there, it was like it's amazing how smell can do that. And I was just like, I hadn't even thought about this memory of watching my nan's slightly wrinkled, um, not crinkly, arthritic hands, you know, pruning the the the, the tomatoes. And it just took me. Um, Took me straight back there. My only link in any way to 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 you know food production was my nan's tomatoes, which mm. I'd forgotten about, which came came back to me. But yeah, no, nothing nothing at all, which was uh, which makes the whole thing and you know the sort of selling of the publishing rights kind of you know all the more uh, mad. But on the other hand, when you actually sort of get into thick of it, not having any idea about anything on certain levels, pain in the ass, you know, because like a lot of Modern farming is about being a mechanic. No, I had no idea about being a mechanic. I'm a bit better now than I used to be, but it's all a bit kind of pieces of string and do it kind of, you know, make it work. Endless problem solving. Farming is just endless, endless problem solving. And things now that, are, you know, you look at things that need to be moved and shifted or whatever. Now I'm like, yeah, okay, we, 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 we can do that. You know, which at the, at the first time that I saw them, that all, everything seemed insurmountable. Mm. On the other hand, you're going into things, you say, well, hang on a minute, why, why are we doing that? And that makes absolutely no sense. And you're like, well, well, we, that's what happened, you know. Well, I, well, I'm, uh, and then he said, well, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going yeah. to try this, you know. So it's a double-edged sword, all that. 
And I think there's no way that I would have, well, there's no way that I would have gone down this road or been able to get down this road if I'd had the baggage of farming ancestry, I think. Uh, and to be totally honest, if I'd not been able to to go to a beater and play some tunes and bail myself out of the shit again yeah. and again and again, you know. So there's a slightly kind of odd Robin Hood thing going on, right? Sort of go to go to a beater, play at space, come back the following day and be sitting down in these halls of like French farmers at a kind of machinery fair where everyone's getting their pen knives out to cut the bread with and stuff, and sort of you know basically taking the uh, the uh, the DJ fees to to, to keep myself keep myself going you know, I can't so. think of a better place to put space's money quite frankly <laughs> I think it's a, it's a beautiful transaction all around and you've got a book coming out in 2023 is that right well that's if I write it if you write it, it right yeah. you need to write this book we need to get this word out um, I'm as I said a million times so excited about what you're doing on so many levels, on the climate crisis situation, on what we're ingesting, and also, I think, inspiring for people to hear you have a completely new chapter, unrelated to the career you were completely known as and comfortable in. I think it's um, it's it's hugely inspiring to hear that, and it's going to give me a good kick up the arse. I can't do much about the plastic grass here, <laughs> but I do have a vegetable patch, I do have a greenhouse that I need to get familiar with because I'm a complete novice so yeah I've got I've got lots of work to do but I'm excited and I can't wait to see what you're doing next and and wait to see how much more of the planet's earth you can take over to to help rectify these huge problems we've got well thanks for having me and yeah we we just got to spread the word this is a message of like hope and empowerment and um you know it's there in front of us now we can we can do this together we've got no excuses we don't need to wait for anyone we just need to get on with it God, I actually can't quite believe how much there is to learn about soil. My brain is bursting and I've, I've become obsessed with this stuff. Like, thank you, Andy. I'm obsessed with Wild Farmed. I love what you and George are doing. It's just, honestly, I've been thinking about it nonstop since this chat. I'm just completely obsessed by it. As Andy said, we don't need to wait for anyone to start making really tangible change. So there are some links in the show notes to resources if you want to get involved. I urge you to. And look, I know I need to learn more about my vegetable patch and I promise I will. I really will. I'm looking forward to it. And I'll be back next week, continuing to keep you company over the festive period. So make sure you're following the podcast for free wherever you're listening to this so that every new episode lands on your device as soon as it's available. In the meantime, God, thank you to Andy. Thank you to the producer, Anushka Tate at Rethink Audio, you absolute gem. And you gorgeous game changers for being here. Every one of you have a wonderful Christmas. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, and we'll catch up soon.